wisdom for your glory and uh, through that glorifying for our good. And we trust you this morning as you speak to us through your word. Please be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Please, as you are seated, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. As you turn there, I'll apologize in advance. I was enjoying the beautiful North Dakota prairie last night, but it seems like the wind blew every bit of pollen right up my nose, and I am dealing with, like many of you are, with that wonderful affliction that happens every spring. So <clears throat> forgive me for a few sniffles uh, here and there. I was reflecting this week because Jesus talks about uh, figs. I'm not sure why I thought about pears. They kind of like the same shape. But anyway, I was thinking about pears and how I really dislike pears. I don't like eating pears. I know it's controversial. Some people love pears. My whole family loves pears. Um, I find them very difficult to eat. They say, well, is it just a texture thing? And I say, well, the problem with pears is that they taste like pears. <laughs> so I don't think it's a texture thing. I, did, I do know a trick, though, a little life hack. If you put pears in a paper bag, and like, a, like a brown paper bag, it makes it a lot easier to throw them in the garbage. Uh, sorry. So just because of that, I think uh, to remind me that I need to love God's creation, when we bought our first house uh, years ago, we didn't know this at the time because we bought it in the wintertime, but in the backyard there was two pear trees. <laughs> so we were blessed year after year with, I mean, hundreds in some cases of pears, which was great because my family loved them. They, were, they say that they're really good pears. I don't think there is such a thing, but they said they're really good. And we had so many that we shared them with all the neighbors. So the neighbors began to get a clue. When the pear tree starts to, the leaves start to come out, the little buds start, they're getting excited because they're getting pears. And it became a thing in the neighborhood. Whenever we had extra, we would load up the neighbors with pears. So this week, uh, Jesus uses the fig tree and reminds us that we need to look at some of the things, something about a fig tree helps us think about how we anticipate what's coming. Okay, just like our neighbors anticipated the pears coming, we can look at what the fig tree represents. It's a little metaphor here, and how we need to look about, think about his return. Not only when he was talking, the things that would happen immediately, uh, but the things that would be ongoing and ultimate events that would come at the end. And so he uses this illustration that we'll talk about, and which really helps us unlock uh, interpretation of the entire chapter as we've been working through it. it helps us see the consistency of our interpretation there. So we're going to talk in Matthew 24. If you haven't turned there, we're going to be in verses 32 through 35 this morning. If you would please stand, if you are able, to honor the reading of God's word. I will read this, and then we will talk about what Jesus is teaching us this morning. Matthew 24, starting in verse 32. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. You may be seated. So Jesus starts off in verse 32 with the parable. That word lesson, he says, from the fig tree learn its lesson, is just the word, uh, the Greek word parabole, which you don't have to be a Greek scholar to see the link, the jump that we take to get from that to parable, but it literally is parable. A parable in scripture is something, is that literally means to put something alongside another. So we have a truth, and we put something else alongside it to help us understand that truth. And that's what a parable is. Jesus told stories, and often he used an earthly lesson, an earthly reality, a physical reality, to, tell, to help tell an, a story with heavenly meaning. So we have earthly reality, and we have heavenly meaning. It's important to remember when we interpret parables like this, uh, to do so wisely. Parables aren't less true than other teaching but they do need to be handled differently. We can't press too far into a parable. Some people try to do this. They look at the fig tree and, they, and analyze what a f uh, the shape of a fig and what it tastes like and what it's made of. And, and the, the, he says the tender branches. What does the tenderness mean? Is that the tenderness of the disciples? Okay, that's just zooming in way, way, way too close for a parable. We need to step back and see what is the general overall meaning of this parable? What's the earthly lesson that it corresponds to the heavenly meaning? And so... 
In this case, we step back and we see that he's talking about things that actually happen to a fig tree. Right? The, it actually changes when the seasons are changing. The, the branches change, the leaves change, and that's how they know that summer is near. There's specific indications, physical indications, that summer is near, but not necessarily that summer is here, or that the season is near, but not a date is here. You understand the difference. He's talking about the nearness, but not the, the definitive date. Our calendar, your calendar, says summer officially starts on June 20th, right? That's the first official day of summer. I don't understand what that means because we have started celebrating summer long before that. In fact, here in North Dakota, what I've learned is we basically start celebrating summer as soon as there's two days above freezing in a row. I mean, and then <laughs> people are in shorts and are like, it's coming. We know it's coming. So it's not necessarily the date, June 20th. It's the season that, it's, uh, that we refer to when we talk about summer. So Jesus is talking about factors that indicate summer's coming, but not exactly when. So the main idea of this short parable is that specific signs will indicate the general nearness of a specific event, but not necessarily the specific time of that event. He's talking about the general nearness. So let's see if that idea, if that parable links then to the heavenly lesson, which he brings in verse 33. So also, so this is the link, got the little parable, the link so also prompts us that he's going to talk about now that heavenly meaning. And here he links the two parts. So we see the branches and the leaves are linked with all these things. He says, "You, when you see all these things, so when you see the branches and the leaves, when you see all these things, then he links you know that summer is near with you know that he is near. And so that's the, the parallelism that he's using here. So the first question we can ask is what is, what is actually near? What's he talking about? And in the ESV, it says he is near. If you have a different translation, it might say it is near. The reason that those may be different is just a little window into biblical translation. Sometimes when you take Greek and you put it, try to put it into English, it doesn't line up exactly. So you don't, you don't have the exact same words in the exact same order. And just, you have to just trust me on that. So in this case, there's no word there for he or it. There is an inference that it's continuing from the previous passage. So what we talked about last week in the previous passage, he's talking specifically about his return. And so when he uses this uh, construct here in this verse, it's referring to that stream of thought. And so it refers back there, so we insert that word he is near or it is near. So meaning Jesus is near or his return is near. And that's why we know that's what he means here. And so Jesus is saying the parallel to this parable is when you see all these things, you know that's when I'm coming back. That's when it's going to, ha that's when it's going to start to happen. So now there's a lot packed into this verse, this heavenly lesson. There's two questions we need to ask. It's good to ask questions of Scripture. It helps us to dig in and find out what he's saying to us. The first question is, what does all these things mean? When he says all these things, what does that actually mean? The second one is, how do we live knowing that he is near? So what does all these things mean, and then how do we live knowing that he is actually near? So let's talk about the first one first. This actually is really important. Defining all these things helps us solve a lot of problems in this whole passage. Apparent problems, I should say. He uses that phrase in verse 33. We just read it. He'll use it again in verse 34, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But if you look back to verse 8 of chapter 24, he already mentioned that when he talked about the wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes. And he says, all these things, all these it's the exact same phrase. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. Okay, so there's a clue. It's always good when, whenever you're studying Scripture, you start with the verse and you just work your way out slowly. And you look, what's the context? What else? Is there any repeated words or phrases in this chapter or in this book? And right now we just zoom out a little ways and see Jesus already used this exact same phrase once before when he's talking about the birth pains. Now remember what this whole chapter is responding to, these whole two chapters. Back in Matthew 24, verse 3, his disciples said, okay, you're talking about the destruction of the temple. Uh, tell us, when, is this, when are these things going to be and what, are the, what is going to be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So they're ask, asking, when's it going to happen and what will we see? Well, because Jesus said, 
when you see all these things. It's going to be something we perceive, okay? And when he, his response to this is not to give a date, but he gives a long list of all these things, patterns, examples that will happen as the day approaches. This is a good reminder. We've been helped by the prophetic perspective. We've talked about this as a mountain range. Remember, we have the image of the mountain range where you're standing on the end of a mountain range and you see the peaks, but you don't necessarily see the valleys in between or how far the, val- the mountain peaks are uh, between them. You see examples. And so Jesus is standing with his, his disciples on the end of this mountain range and he's in this whole chapter describing what is going to happen until the end. And if you just scan through, what do we see? The temple's going to be destroyed. False Christs will rise up. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other. There'll be famines and earthquakes and tribulation. Uh, People will be put to death because they believe in Jesus. They'll be hated and opposed. Many will fall away. There'll be false prophets who arise. Lawlessness will increase. The love of others will grow cold. The gospel will go to all nations. There'll be misleading signs and wonders. All this is the birth pains. And remember, the nature of birth pains is they they start, you know when they begin, the contractions start. You don't know how long they're going to last until the end. So the most natural reading for what all these things means is that they're the ongoing, increasing birth pains that he's already been discussing. All the persecutions, all the tribulations, all the oppositions from the Jews and the Romans and the early church the destruction of the temple, and everything, every affliction, large and small, that happens until he returns. Now, Jesus does not say how long it will last. He doesn't say when it's going to end. He says the end is near, not the end is here. And that's an important distinction. So that's the first question. From the context, what does he mean when he says all these things? The second question is, how do we live knowing that he is near. What does his nearness teach us about how we should live? Clearly, he's trying to convey a sense of urgency or immediacy because he says it's at the very door. So there's, a, there's an urgency present. And the New Testament is full of these warnings and instructions not to be lazy when you're thinking about the return of Jesus. I, I have a sample if you want to, to see just how frequent it occurs. Hebrews 10 He says, keep meeting together, encourage one another, all the more as the day draws near. That day of the Lord draws near. In chapter, in verse 36, endure, do the will of God, receive the promise of God, for yet a little while he will come. James 5, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. We see that show up in Scripture quite a bit. 1 Peter 4, the end is at hand, so be self-controlled and sober-minded. In fact, the whole book of Revelation, the very first verse, John is told, I'm giving you these things to show, so you may show these things that soon must take place. And then Jesus, the second to last verse of the Bible is Jesus saying, surely I am coming soon. So it's all over the New Testament. So somehow we need to keep in mind that his return is soon or near. But it's a little hard for us because it's been so long since he went to heaven. So how do we think about this? It's not always that we get in Scripture a concise answer to our questions. But in this case, we have one. The Apostle Peter wrote an entire chapter of the Bible answering these two questions. What do we think about his nearness and what are we supposed to do in the meantime? And we're going to scan through this now. It's going to go really quick. So I hope that as we do this, that maybe the Holy Spirit just has you latch onto one thing or one idea because there's a lot here. It's 2 Peter chapter 3. The whole chapter is literally Peter, as if he heard us ask this question, saying, here's what it means to think about God's nearness, and here's what it means to live in the meantime. So if you want to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 and make a mark of it or make a note, come back here if you, when you have that question pop up in your mind. Let's just scan through it. I have five observations from the first part of the question. Is what does his nearness mean? Well, how are we supposed to understand what soon is when he says, I'm coming soon? The first one, he is near in the sense that he will come 
He will return, and every second is closer to it happening. This is a statement of the certainty of the event, that Jesus said it will happen. And we see this in 2 Peter 3, verse 2. Peter says, You should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So he's basically saying, remember what the prophets said, remember what Jesus said, remember what the apostles said. They all testify to the same thing. This is going to happen. So when the Bible talks about the nearness of it, it's linked to its certainty. It's near because it certainly will happen. And every second we live is closer to that happening. Secondly, he is near in the sense that the birth pains continue as just as he said they would. Peter is warning in this chapter about scoffers. He says scoffers are going to rise up and they're going to begin to basically mock us for what we believe. And he specifically says in verse 4 of 2 Peter 3, they'll say, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Essentially, we don't believe you. You say he's coming back. Nothing has changed. He hasn't come back yet. We don't think it's actually going to happen. But their testimony, their proclaiming this, actually proves that the birth pains are continuing. And Peter shows us that in the next few verses. If you read, he, he describes how everything that's being done is being stored up for fire, is being stored up for wrath. Literally, every act of unrighteousness, every sin, every ch- anything, everything that's done against his people and his church is just being piled up for punishment and wrath at the end. And so the presence of all these things, the fact that they observe that everything is continuing is the proof that the birth pains continue. And Peter's saying, essentially, if we use the prophetic perspective, you're in the mountain range somewhere on your way to the end. You may not know where you are, but you're there. And it will continue until God says it's done. So he's near in that we're living in that time and the birth pains continue. Thirdly, he's near in the sense that God does not reckon time as we do. And this is verse 8. He says, But do not, not overlook this one fact, beloved. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, this is not Peter trying to delve into the theory of relativity and astrophysics and the time space continuum. He's not doing that. That's not the point here. The point is, we can't judge God's timeline based on our perspective. It's a different timeline. And he uses this as an example. Someone actually took it literally, and, which we're not supposed to do, but he just, just to show, just to make the point, if you actually take that proportion, a thousand years in a day, and you apply it to the 30 or so years between when Jesus said what he said to when Peter wrote this, he said 30 years would be only about 45 minutes in God's perspective. And even if you expend, extend it to a lifetime of 100 years, that only works out to be 2.5 hours. Now again, The specifics are not the point. The point is we can't think about time the same as God does. It's different. Coincidentally, if you do this math also, my sermons are only like 0.4 seconds long. (laughs) So, so there. We can't see the same as God sees time. Fourthly, he is near in the sense that his return is the next major event in redemptive history. Redemptive history is the ongoing story that God is writing to save his people. And this, his coming is near because it's the next major event. We had, in the Old Testament, it pointed ahead to that, Jesus coming, living his life, dying on the cross, rising again. Then he ascended to heaven, and he's there until the next thing, which is his return. And this is probably the most vivid of our illustrations because we have a role to play in the unfolding of redemptive history. He said, the last thing he said before he left was, go make disciples, go proclaim the gospel to all the earth. And he told us to do that. So it's our job to continue that until the end. There's an urgency to fulfill the Great Commission as part of his redemptive narrative. And he is near in the sense that that will be complete when the Great Commission is fulfilled. 
And lastly, he's near in the sense that even with the indications we have in Scripture, we still do not know exactly when it will happen. We cannot know exactly. And we'll talk about this more next week. We cannot know. It will come, verse 10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. So his nearness, Peter, as he reflects on this, forces us to think about life in a certain way. The whole New Testament talks about it, and Peter says we need to use the, define, the divine definition of nearness as the definitive de- definition. And then, again, Peter answering this question for us, the second half of the chapter is basically, okay, what do we do until that happens? He starts in verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, meaning everything's going to happen, Jesus is going to come back, make new heavens and the new earth, the end, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? He says, in the meantime, pursue holiness, which is holiness in everywhere, every area of your life, sanctifying your thoughts, sanctifying your actions, killing sinful desires, resisting temptations, and fighting sin. That's pursuing holiness holiness and pursuing godliness, which is identifying more and more with Christ and less and less like the world. This is the opposition of of godliness and worldliness. Avoiding the corruption, the sin, the stain, Scripture calls the stain of the world, and walking more and more in the character of Christ. He just exhorts them, as the day draws near, pursue holiness pursue godliness. And he goes on, waiting for, in verse 12, and hastening the coming of the day of God. So there's the waiting or the eager anticipation, the excitement about it coming, that's part of it, and then the hastening, which is interesting. Hastening implies that we have an active engagement and participation in the mission. We don't actually hasten. It's not in the sense that we're doing things that make God send Jesus back sooner. But God ordains, God ordains the ends and the means. In this case, he ordains the end, how things will resolve, but the means as to how we get there. And we learned earlier in this chapter that the gospel will be proclaimed to all nations and then the end will come. That process, the means of that happening is us proclaiming the gospel. And so in that sense, our continued service to the Great Commission is hastening the day of his return, our active engagement, our part in the gospel. And he skipped down to verse 14. He's, he adds, since you're waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. So being without spot or blemish, blemish this is the ongoing cleansing work of the Holy Spirit. You remember, we are cleansed when we're saved, forgiven of our sins, And we are cleansed from unrighteousness. In 1 John 1, it talks about as we confess our sins, as we repent, as we follow him and obey him, we're continually cleansed of all unrighteousness. This is that desire to be without spot or blemish, walking in humility and confession with the Holy Spirit. Then he says, be at peace. This is peace with God, contentment in God. Romans 5 1 says, since we've been justified with faith, we have peace with God. So we were enemies, and he made us part of his family. We have peace with God because of his work. And in 1 Timothy 6, Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. There is a contentment that comes when we realize we have peace with God, that he is our Father and loves us. And That is all wrapped into being at peace as we seek to follow him more. Verse 17, he says, he warns us not to be carried away with the error of lawless people and so lose our stability. And this is the reminder, once again, to guard against false teaching. People who claim the Bible says something, people who claim Jesus is one way or another way. He says, if you do that, you'll lose your stability, your foundation. Guard against false teaching. Learn what is true. Rely upon what is true. 
reject what is false. And at the end, verse 18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to grow in the grace and knowledge? Well, as you grow in his grace, as you're stronger in his grace, the more you realize how much more you need his grace. And the more you know him, the more you realize how much you want to know him even more. I commend this chapter to you. For some reason, the Bible over and over talks about how important it is to keep our minds on his return and have it affect our lives. And Peter just lays it out for us from start to finish. Read it. uh, Let the word speak to you. And let it convict us about how we live. Remind ourselves regularly that he is near and to live accordingly. So then, he gets to verse 34, the prediction. He says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Okay, now if we're not careful, this is why we spent so much time a few minutes ago talking about what all these things are means. Because if we don't, we might be tempted to say, is Jesus saying that he's going to return in the lifetime of the people he's talking with? That's what it sounds like, in this generation. But if all these things means the beginning of the birth pains, which we talked about a few minutes ago, then what Jesus is saying is that all the tribulation, all the affliction and the distress of the birth pains will begin in the lifetimes of the people listening. That's what that means. It's the beginning of the birth pains. He's not talking about the end of the distress or his return, but the beginning of the process. This generation that he's speaking to will experience a sample of what's to come. They might only get over the the first mountain peak. They might even even get to the first mountain in the mountain range. But they will see the beginning of all these things. So we don't have to worry that he made a mistake, that he said he was going to come back but didn't because obviously he didn't come back 2,000 years ago. He's simply talking about the fact that these things will start showing up immediately, and they did. His disciples experienced persecution and opposition immediately as soon as he left. So this came true right after he was was gone and they experienced it even in that generation. But then he ends the passage, this section, with the promise. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So he states two things. Again, all these things will happen. When he says Will pa- heaven and earth will pass away. He's talking about the end when everything is made new. It's all going to, what, what you see, what you're experiencing is all going to pass away and what's eternity is going to be much different. So it will happen and my words will last forever. This is another incredible s- statement. Jesus is claiming to be God. He is clearly claiming divinity here. Psalm 119 89, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Isaiah 40, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. That's what we say about the word of God. Jesus is saying, my word will never pass away. Jesus is fully and truly God, fully and truly man, and one fully and truly unique person. And he again claims it here. And he says, all the words of Jesus... All the things that he said are more trustworthy than the planet they were standing on. They're more secure than the existence of the universe, more dependable than the laws of nature. They're more unshakable than the most formidable mountain and more reliable than the rising of the sun. You can completely trust his word to be true and to come true. You can believe all of his promises and you can completely stake your life on the assurance of his salvation. We have complete, we can have absolute complete confidence that the Bible, the record of Jesus, who he is, and what he wants us to know, the Bible is the authoritative, inerrant, infallible, inspired, and sufficient word of God. He's given us what we need to know about him, how we must be saved, and how we're supposed to live. 
It's not, it's, it doesn't change. It's not flexible. We don't need any other source of revelation. We don't need to find out what God is saying different today. It's here for us. He's given it to us. He's given it to us for generations. We can trust it. Creation testifies, nature testifies to the existence of God and His glory. The Bible testifies to the nature of God, how we know His nature, and what His will is for us. The question after a sermon like this, and I was sitting after doing all this study and learning all these things, we learned a lot. I mean, I, there's a lot of information here. The question really is, why is this important? If I'm going to walk out of here, how does this affect how I think, how I live my daily life? And that's a valid question. We should be asking that of the word. It's supposed to apply to us and how we think and what we, how we act. So thinking about what Jesus is reminding us, we read what Peter said, He's coming soon. There's a nearness. What is, how, do I, how do I think about that? How do I process that? If you live your life in a way that keeps the nearness of Christ's return prominent in your mind, you'll be prepared to meet him when he comes and you'll be prepared to face everything that happens to you in the meantime. That's the answer. When life is falling apart or whatever situation you find yourself in, what's your hope to get you through? I meet with people all the time where just life is falling apart in front of them. There has to be something beyond, something bigger. Colossians 1 Paul's talking to the Colossians and he says, I'm praying for you since I heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, so their, their life of faith, and the love they have for the saints, their love for each other, the two things, you love God, love people, that's what God told them to do. He says, I heard about it. And how are you doing it? He says, verse 5, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Their motivation for loving God and loving people is tied up in the hope that's laid up for or secure for them in heaven. That's what they're looking to. They're looking past what they're going through to something. The beginning of this chapter, I mentioned that we would be talking about 2 Timothy 4 quite a bit. It comes up regularly because it encapsulates how we think about the end. He, uh, Paul says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This loving his appearing, what helps you fight hard and finish well and keep the faith? It's loving when he returns or when you see him and everything that that means. I've described it as fuel before, uh, fuel for the Christian life, but also think of it as an anchor, firmly fixed in heaven, and he is just slowly drawing us to him every day through everything. When life is disintegrating, when things seem to be happening over and over again, we need to point to something that's bigger, something that's more sure and more secure to pull us through? Do we trust that Jesus is coming back to set things straight, to make all things new? If, he, if we do, then we don't have to fall into despair. We can hope that what he promised will pass. Do we trust his promise to wipe our tears and heal our hearts? If so, we don't have to fear anything that anyone says or does to us. Do we trust that God will ultimately punish every sin and wickedness? Every sin will be paid for either by the sinner or the Savior. Do you trust that? If you do, that releases you from bitterness toward people and resentment and anger and revenge because you know that when Jesus comes, every sin will be paid for either by the person who committed it or by Jesus taking the sin upon himself. 
that frees us from vengeance. Do you trust that God is working, as we sang, all things for our good and for His glory? If so, then we don't have to worry. He's promised to take care of it. He's promised and we can trust Him. This is what I mean when I talk about the fact that we need to see God bigger every day. God doesn't actually get bigger, of course. He's as big as He ever will be. He's always been the biggest. But we need to see Him as bigger. When God is bigger, everything is better. When you see God as bigger, you see everything else clearer. We must always press ourselves to see God and experience God bigger so that He is more sovereign, more glorious, more real to us. And this is why we need to remind ourselves regularly to grow in love for His appearing and everything that means. Because every time we do, we should love Jesus more and God should be bigger to us. And if we do this, we will fight the good fight. We will finish the race. We will keep the faith until we see him face to face. And that will happen. We can be sure of it because he said, surely I am coming soon. If we live that way, church, always in our hearts, with anticipation and joy of his coming, when he fulfills that promise and everything is made new and right, we will overflow with worship and glory for his name. And it will be great. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful for this reminder that you again, in this time of your teaching your disciples, show us the importance of keeping your return on our minds and in our hearts. Help us remember today and every day that we are not supposed to just sit around bored, lifeless, just waiting for us to die or for you to come. You have given us a wonderful, glorious, clear role in the meantime. And that's to share this with others. There's people all around us who don't have hope. They don't have anything beyond what they're going through. And they don't have the anchor that's pulling them past their chaos. We have it. So help, as this reminds us, give us a burden to help as many as we can see the light and see the hope that you offer. Let that be what drives us to love your appearing more and more and to see you bigger every single day, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we close?